Hey everyone, welcome back to Bridge Stories. You are listening to Season 2. If you're new to our podcast, this is our place where we just sit down and give people space and time to tell stories of how they've encountered God and been changed by Him. This season we're going to be sitting down with some familiar faces to many of you, and we hope that you'll get a little deeper glimpse into who they are and the things that God has brought them through. We're also excited to get to introduce you to some new people, some people with some incredible stories to share of how God has provided and encouraged them and helped them to live out a life of faith. We hope that these stories encourage you and challenge you in your faith as you walk closer to Jesus than ever before, as you seek him with all of your heart. So sit back and enjoy and be encouraged as you listen. With that, let's jump in. All right, let's do it. Cool. Another time. Um, Roxy, welcome. Thanks. Glad that you said yes. I uh, I was laughing because I was thinking about how this came together, and um, I had thought of you. I texted your husband and said, uh, hey, could I get your wife's contact information? I want to ask her something. And he sent me your contact, and I still have it saved. I went to look, and it's uh, Sweet Roxanne with a bunch of hearts. <laughs> So um, I'm going to have to change it to your real Probably. name. I think he's the only one uh, who should have it in there, a sweet Roxanne with extra hearts. That is so funny. But thanks for saying yes. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. Yeah. I, I think we'll just do what we always do. Let's just talk about your life. And uh, as we go, we'll just follow our, our curiosity and our conversation. And um, so just tell us about you. Where did you come from? Where did you grow up? Yeah. So I grew up in Orange. I grew up... Um, my parents still live in the same house that I grew up in. So right by like Peter's Canyon mm. area up yeah. the hill. So yeah, I grew up there. Um, it was me and my sister. My I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest of four now. But growing up, it was just me and then Isabel, who's four years younger than me. So um, yeah, we grew up as, you know, in a Christian household. We went to a neighborhood church. Um, our neighbor, when we were like moving into the house he was he does like neighborhood walks and just kind of prays over everybody and he was opening up his his church that week that my parents moved in and so he invited them he's like hey I'm starting a church you guys want to come check it out so we did and then we were there for 18 years so like my whole childhood oh my gosh. We were there yeah super cool so um yeah we grew up going there um really good childhood just we traveled a lot. My dad owned his own business, so he had a lot of, like, time freedom. So we spent most, like, summers um, in our motorhome going to different places around the States. So super fun childhood. And was being in a motorhome with your whole family, is that, like, good memories? Oh, yeah. Okay. Very good memories. Yeah. I know people who grew up in the motorhome, and it's, it's, like, yeah. it's like hectic, crazy yeah. memories. No, it was always so fun. I think the most hectic part, part was, like, getting the motorhome loaded and like ready to go. My mom would always be like, ah, do we have everything? Like, are we good? Cause we'd be gone for like weeks at a time. So it was a lot of like on my parents' side, it was a lot of planning yeah. that went into it. But you know, we had so much fun. My grandparents would go with us. So a lot of the time my sister and I would like, you know, at a, at a pit stop, we'd jump my grandparents' motorhome and ride with them. So yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that growing up. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, as we have small kids, one of the things we really want is to create traditions like that. I didn't yeah. grow up with a lot of traditions like that, um, mm -hmm. but really longing to do it. It's so cool that, that you had that. Yeah, I feel so grateful. Um, and it just like, Skylar and I now, we love camping. So I think it kind of like instilled that in me to where you don't have to like spend a ton of money or go on these like extravagant trips or go out of the country to have good travel experiences so yeah we, we did a lot of stuff like throughout the states but we would also just do like big bear and the desert and easy mm -hmm. stuff like that so yeah. yeah it was really fun doing that growing up i heard someone say recently that um waking up in yosemite valley is more beautiful than uh, a ten thousand dollar a night hotel room could yeah. ever be oh my gosh have you been to yosemite oh yeah okay yeah. yeah it's the it's so true we're actually going in a few weeks it's like our favorite place ever first time i ever went my um my grandmother took me and a cousin mm -hmm. and i remember there's that spot when you come in and you get like the full panoramic view of the valley yes and i remember oh. in my mind thinking like this isn't registering. Like, what am I looking at? Yeah. It almost doesn't seem real. No, it's like the most beautiful thing. We, um, Skylar and I have gone almost every year since we've been married. And we're crazy because we normally like to go in the wintertime because it's 
super empty. Like no one's really there during that time yeah. of year. Um, but we like to tent camp. So we normally go tent camping like in the snow. And this year we're like, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> like we're approaching 30. We're like, we're done with that craziness. You're getting so old. I know. The wisdom is catching <laughs> up to you. <laughs> yeah. Or not the wisdom, but like the wet socks and the just, yeah, it's yeah uh, it's too much now one of the things i've noticed about camping i grew up doing a fair bit of camping but camping's not a really easy thing for people to just pick up in adulthood yeah sometimes you meet people and they're like i would never do yeah. that and you're like what it's <laughs> one of the greatest things ever totally <laughs> yeah no we love it it's fun so yeah i definitely think i got a lot of that from my childhood just growing up and i mean motorhome camping obviously is a little bit more you know a little bit more comfortable but so, so people will want to know you grew up in orange which uh, which schools did you go to so all of my schools were basically on chapman so i went to chapman hills elementary school and then san Diego middle school and then el medina high school okay so and then i didn't go to college well i went to san Diego college for a semester and then i'm just a working i'm a working type i school was not for me yeah so i stopped <laughs> yeah you know, it's interesting. I don't know what your experience is, but I feel like the um, kind of the trend or the vibe around going off to college is changing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people for a long time. When I was in high school, it was sort of like, if you're not going to college right after, you're kind of lesser. Mm -hmm. I, I went, but there was a period of time where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. Yeah. Some of it was the peer pressure, but I feel like there's this new trend of like, there are so many wonderful opportunities and jobs and experiences to have. And yeah. is, is college really worth it? And I think a lot um, of people are landing on it is for some people and it isn't for others. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think um, I'm also really grateful for my parents. They were never the like, you have to go to college type. And I think that that's necessary in some you know, households. I think parents obviously know best mm -hmm. their kids. Um, but for me and for my sister... That was never something that was like pressed on us, but their whole thing was either you're going to college or you're working, like you're, you're doing one of the two. So I went the working route and then my sister is getting her master's and then probably going to go on to get her PhD. So we're ve we took two very different <laughs> routes with it, but my parents have always been like, <clears throat> um, have always just encouraged us to do like what we felt was best. Um, obviously giving us their their insight, not just letting us go crazy. But yeah, I think they really did a good job of encouraging us in those things. And then just to see, you know, how we've gone kind of our different paths in working or education. Um, it's been really cool. So I'm really grateful. My parents just kind of allowed that freedom for us. Mm. Um, did you uh, play sports as a kid or, or what kind of activities um, were you like? Yeah. So growing up, I was always like in dance and that kind of stuff in high school I did cheer so I was never like the I never did soccer or softball or anything that that was all my sister so okay. again two very different like things in childhood as far as sports goes so what year did you graduate high school 2013 okay so you graduate in 2013 mm -hmm. um then what happens so 2013 graduate high school um this time by this time, we were going to a different church in, um, uh, I think it was in Laguna, and it was one of my dad's best friends, so he started this church. We were meeting out of an elementary school, and it was super small. It was called Salt, and um, Gene Mulway was the pastor, so he's one of my dad's best friends. Um, so we were going there for a while, and during that time, I started spending a lot of time with my friends from church. Um, so 2016 was actually a year that I met Skylar. Um, we met through mutual friends of my church, and then Jean, our pastor, was with us. I'm kind of like jumping ahead to oh, that's okay. I met Skylar. But <laughs> You're excited to so, tell us, so let's I know, tell I love it. it. <laughs> so we, um, we were all at lunch, and it was just some of our friends, and then Jean and his wife were with us. And one of our friends was like, hey, can I invite my friend Skylar? And we're like, yeah, you know, whatever. So Skylar comes in, we're at Bear Flag Fish Tacos. Oh, yeah. And he walks in like, oh, my gosh, he's so cute. I'm like, who is this friend? Like, where has he been? So he sits down at our table, and Gene was like, he loved love, and he loved, like, setting all of us kids up, and it was really sweet. So he sits down, and um, Gene was like, hey, what's your name? You know, how old are you? What do you do for work? 
And Skylar told him he was a youth pastor. So Gene was like, okay, he's a Christian. He goes, um, have you met Roxy? Just like completely puts us on the spot. <laughs> and it was like so embarrassing. But I was also like, okay, good job, Gene. Like, I think he's so cute. And so, um, yeah, we kind of pretty much started dating like shortly after that. And then um, we were engaged a year later and then married a year later. Wow. Mm -hmm. Happened fast just because yeah. a guy walked into Bear Flag. That's it. Yep. Bear Flag is the hot spot for finding a spouse, it's I guess. Spot. Yeah. <laughs> it's also the spot for really good fish. Oh my gosh, it's so good. And they're pokey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. Um, uh, you mentioned going to different churches as a kid. Mm -hmm. what, what was kind of, um, not necessarily the, the faith of your family or the upbringing, but what was your faith like? Yeah. So I was actually, I just got coffee with Michelle actually a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about this. We had kind of like a similar experience where I don't feel like I've ever had like a, a moment in my life where like God became real. Um, it was just always, I, I think just growing up, he, he always existed in, in my life and our household. Um, my whole family, they're all believers. And so it was never, it just was always something that it was just a reality for me in my life. And so I think throughout high school, like that kind of went through some ebbs and flows, but, um, yeah, I think I always, I always had a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, I, he always felt very real to me and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it, he, he just always existed in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're saying that, I, I'm just curious. Um, how did your parents model that? You know, so often people with kind of what you're saying, I, I find that a lot of times their parents are just really healthy in their own relationships, mm -hmm. very realistic. Yeah. Yeah. They, my parents had, um, have a great marriage and I think they set, um, they really just set a good tone in our household. Um, even just like typical daily practices or weekly, like we always went to church. That was always like a non-negotiable, um, but it never felt like pressure from my parents. I don't, mm. I don't know how they did that, but it was like, this is what we're doing, but I also want it to be your decision. They balanced it very well. But um, yeah, they, they have a really great marriage. They both have a lot of respect for me and my sister. Um, and then my sister and I obviously you know, respected them a lot as, as parents. And I think, again, kind of getting into high school, that got a little bit more difficult just because, you know, like when you get into the high school age, there's things that you want to do and your parents push back against that. And so you push back against them. And so I think that got more challenging in high school. But um, I think ultimately, like now where I'm at in my faith, I'm really grateful that my parents you know, raised my sister and I the way that they did. Um, yeah. So I think, I don't know, does that kind of answer? Yeah, question? totally. I think, um, that high school piece is a, an interesting time. It's like this, mm -hmm. this, uh, bridging between childhood and slowly becoming like an emerging adult. Yeah. And I think so often faith ends up as kind of a, by the wayside in that period of time, mm -hmm. we'll see it as like this childish thing that I'm leaving behind because I'm becoming an adult. Yeah. So for you, um, what were, what were kind of the, I don't know about the issues or the, the speed bumps along the way in high school? Cause high school is a crazy time. Even if you know, Jesus high school, yeah. especially a public high school in orange County, there's yeah. a lot of, uh, temptations and things. Yeah. It was so weird because like in high school, it was this, it was a really big like tension for me. Like all my friends knew that I was a Christian. Um, but at the same time, like I was doing a lot of things that were not like matching up with my morals and like my beliefs. And, but I was so aware of it throughout my whole time in high school of like doing things I knew I shouldn't be doing, but I continued to do them. Um, and it was also weird because at this time I was going to my childhood church. And so I was very much involved in like the high school group. And when we had like any kind of events or like our lock-in, I would invite all my friends from high school and they would all come. So it was like kind of just a weird time because I'd be inviting my friends to this stuff and we would have fun. But then like the next night we'd all go out and be partying. So it was just really weird. I felt like I was kind of living like, mm. like I had my, I had like 
two feet and two worlds. Um, so it was a really just kind of weird thing to navigate. Um, but again, I felt that like kind of conviction um, a lot of that time that I was in high school. So, yeah. yeah. What, what do you feel like that's kind of equipped you for? Because, um, I mean, we could just tell people now you're, you're uh, volunteering in our youth group. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 2013 and 2023 in a lot of ways could just be a totally different universe. Yeah. But a lot of the issues are still the same. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you feel like that equipped you to kind of lead and and help um, high school students now? Yeah, I think um, I would say like it's really easy to fall into what the people around you are doing. But I think if you kind of like take a step back and look at your life and like what you want your life to look like in the long run, just kind of asking yourself like, is what I'm going to be doing in this moment leading me more towards that life or, or not? And if not, like, why do it? I mean, a party at at, like a part, a high school party, I feel like when you miss it or when your parents say you can't go, it feels like the end of the world, right? Like everybody's going, like, I just want to be there. I want to have fun. But in reality, it's like, it's one night and then it's done, you know? And so I don't know, but also I will say these, like these high school and even like the junior high kids, these are like the coolest kids I've ever met. Like they are so, they all love Jesus so much. And um, I know, like you said, a lot of these temptations and realities of high school are still very much so real but I don't know these kids are so like on fire for Jesus and it's yeah. really they're so cool they're all every so time awesome. I go up there I'm always blown away because um for me I was very uncomfortable in my own skin mm-hmm. I'm always blown away how um how free it seems like they feel just to be themselves yeah totally it's like, um, I feel like that in and of itself, what a huge um, just blessing to feel like I can be me. Yeah. Because I think so often that's one of the uh, the hurdles of like really knowing Jesus is I don't even know who I really am or I'm not mm-hmm. even comfortable with who I am. And at least for me in the teenage mind, I was so preoccupied with like, who are my friends and where do I yeah. fit in and all of those sorts of things. So you're talking about um, kind of challenging kids to think down the road of who do you want to be setting that in in motion when you were um a girl high school middle school what did you want to be um honestly I don't I don't know like there was never really anything in my life that I was like I knew that I wanted to do or I knew that I wanted to be um I knew I wanted to be married someday I knew I wanted to be a mom and that was kind of it I was like, I don't know why nothing else seemed to really matter. Like career wise, it was never, that was never like a big deal to me of like, what am I going to do? You know? Did you feel pressure like that you should know that? Not really. And again, I think that was because of my parents and the way that they just kind of allowed the freedom for my sister and I to kind of figure out our life, um, and kind of what we wanted to do. And, um, yeah, and, like, I even, like, in adulthood, like, being married to Skylar, I think I did go through waves of, like, you know, I've been working for my family's company for so long. Like, maybe I should be doing something else. Maybe I should go back to school and or go to school, to college, and, like, get a degree and do something else. But I think when I, like, really sit and think about, like, what is it that I want to do or, like, what what are my values, what is important to me, I genuinely think that, I just care for people and like I'm a big like I don't know I'm a big like relationship builder and like that's kind of what matters to me and I think with my job like working for my family I do you know like for this I had to put on a time off request but I also (laughs) do have a lot of like flexibility with my schedule and I think it allows me to like go meet up with people from church like to go get coffee and just like really invest in the relationships that matter to me yeah and so when I when I look at that in like hindsight I'm like I don't know that for me a career path or like what I'm contributing to society really I don't know if this is the right thing to say but like really matters to me mm-hmm. um I think it's just like my my home like my family 
and then the relationships that I build, like that's what matters to me. Yeah, it's so interesting how you said that because I think like our world is selling us this idea that if you're not, you know, working or pursuing something, you're not contributing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a, like a bankrupt message, like oh, yeah. pouring into people is contributing more to society in so many ways. I, I'm not, I, I'm not demeaning your work or anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that sometimes, you know, the idea of like working in a cubicle and, and increasing the bottom line for a corporation being seen as fulfilling mm -hmm. and then like the demeaning of like staying at home with kids or a mm -hmm. wife or whatever it is, is like seen as less than like yeah. what a strange piece yeah. of our world. Yeah, no, it is so interesting. And I think like there are, you know, everybody has a different drive and a different thing that they um, feel like they need to contribute or like certain people who know like this is the career path I want to take. And I think that God uses that in all of us, which I think, I mean, obviously our world would not be functional if everybody had this feeling of just like <laughs> wanting to stay home and like, you know, I mean, I, I work, but I work from home. And so yeah. um, if everybody felt like I did, then there wouldn't be much of anything like and the world would not be very productive. <laughs> Maybe it would be very like, you know, the relationships would be great. But, um, but then on this, on the other hand too, I think if everybody in the world had this, you know, drive to want to move forward in a career and be so career focused and like relationships would be harder to build. So I think that God like puts different desires in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it all works very like harmoniously, you know? I love that you um, you already recognize in yourself. It, it seems like there's got to be tremendous freedom in like who God made you to be as like a relational connector, mm -hmm. because I, I gotta believe that just translates to all parts of life. And wherever you land, you just know that's who I am. And I feel like that's yeah. a really a really beautiful thing. Like wherever I land, I'm gonna build relationships and connect yeah. with high schoolers or at work or church or whatever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it definitely takes that pressure off of like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? How did you uh, kind of come to that understanding that that's just how God created you? I think a lot of it was through conversation with Skylar when, so when we were married, I think maybe like six or seven months into us being married, so he was a junior high pastor at a church in Costa Mesa. And yeah. then um, there was a lot of like structural changes. So he took a step back a month before we got married. He was like out of a job <laughs> a month before we got married. We're like, it's okay, we'll figure it out. Um, but he started substitute teaching just as something to kind of like provide an income. And then he was like, I really love this. Like, I think I want to go back to school to be a teacher. And so I think it, at that point when he you know, I was 23 going back to school. I'm like, dang, like if he can change his career at this point, like maybe I should be too. So that's when like things kind of started. And then I think it was like coming to that conclusion was just through conversation with him of like, just really bringing it back down to like what matters to me. Um, so yeah, I think it was just kind of through conversation with him, like in that season of feeling like I needed to do more. How, how cool is that? Because I think um, you don't always uh, assume that 23-year-olds who are married are going to have this type of conversation and already be like a very yeah. mature support system for one another. Yeah. What a blessing that yeah. is. So uh, go back a, a little bit and tell us about, you met Skylar in a fish house, mm -hmm. more or less. Yep. Um, and then you started dating. So, uh, talk us through that. Um, yeah. So we were dating <clears throat> for a year. Um, he was a junior high pastor, so he, his schedule was so busy. <laughs> and for a lot of that time before I came into the picture, his whole like schedule revolved around church and hanging out with students and I don't know, all that stuff. And so when I came into the picture, I'm like, wait a minute, like, and I'm such a relationship, like, quality time person, so I'm like, when are we going to hang out, so that was, like, kind of hard, honestly, at the beginning, was just figuring out, our, and we had opposite schedules, like, he worked on the weekends when I was off, so I think right away, we were kind of forced into, like, I don't know, like, making things work, and kind of I don't know, we didn't just get to, like, jump in and just, like, have fun, it was like, no, we have to, like, figure out schedules, like figure out how we're actually going to spend time together. But we did. And um, 
yeah, it was such a fun time. He, uh, I mean, he's just the best. He, like, I fell in love with him so quickly. I was, like, ready to marry him, like, right away. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, like, barely 19 when we, or barely 20 when we met. Um, but, yeah, he, uh, we just had a really fun, like, dating life. Um, he molded into my family very well. Mm. And then his family, it was just him and his mom and his dad. But um, I got along with them really well and our family started doing stuff together and wow. yeah, we just had a lot of fun in that time i'm laughing because i um when i met my wife i was a middle school uh-huh. pastor as well yeah. I, I feel like our experience was very much like there's very limited time yeah like so let's not beat around the bush let's like have like just serious conversations mm-hmm. um not like pushing the envelope or anything we dated for almost two years before even getting engaged but yeah. it was very much like we just don't have time to waste on like how's the weather really yeah um, so I, I totally relate with that I also relate with um, having to come to the realization that um, that when you're 50 hours just going nuts with middle schoolers playing <laughs> airsoft and surfing and yeah that, that it's really difficult to help someone through words understand what happened unless they were there so it was like mm-hmm. a very um it's kind of a challenging season in that way. Yeah, definitely. So how did you feel about uh, middle school ministry just out of curiosity? Was it like, wow, that's cool, but that's your thing? Was yes. it like, I'll jump right in because I love middle school? No, or? not at all. Sorry, at that- middle school. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny now because it's like I... I Let's pause. I'm actually- uh, <laughs> moment of silence for Casey and Lima. They are godsend. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. yeah, they're so fun. Um, no, it's funny because I, I had no interest. I was like very supportive from afar, but I kind of felt like I was still, I don't know, I felt very close to their age, mm. which was weird because I, I really wasn't. But again, I was like barely 20 years old and I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm not, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you know, Skylar somewhat and he's like crazy and loud and funny. And I mean, Joel and Abby know with the high schoolers, he's just like, he's funny and he has the energy for it. And I'm just very much on a lower level than that. And so I'm like, I am not going to go play, you know, zombies versus humans on a Wednesday night. Like that's just not my jam. And so I supported him from afar, but it was not, it was not for me, but it's funny because with us serving in high school here, I was actually the one who was like, I think we should start doing this. He was like, really? I'm like, yes. So (laughs) it kind of like the tables kind of turned over the years but if I'm reading you correctly you strike me more as like because you're saying you're very relational but you strike me more as like like this or a small group yeah very much Um, so that the does does like the crowd and the action is that just sort of like it's just not my my thing no not really I mean I don't mind it it doesn't like I don't get like anxious in those settings at all but I just don't I yeah I think I'm just more of like I like to really connect with people and like learn about them and like tell them about my life and see how God is working in both of our lives. And so I'm very much so like one-on-one smaller groups type of a person. Yeah. So if anyone's listening and wants to hang out with Roxy, it's got to be a (laughs) a small group. Yeah. (laughs) Don't drain her. Um, Okay. So you're dating, you have a great time dating. Mm -hmm. Youth ministry is kind of his thing. You support it, but a little bit of a distance. So clearly um, you said you fell in love immediately. Yeah. Um, I did. You're ready to get hitched. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, walk us through being engaged and then getting married. Yeah, so we got engaged in summertime of 2017. Okay. Um, he proposed in, my family has a, a <clears throat> cabin in Idaho in Coeur d'Alene. And so I grew up, we grew up going there every summer. And so Skylar started coming with us when we um, started dating. And then he proposed up there with like our whole family there. It was really cool. So um, engagement felt like it went by so fast. Yeah. Like wedding planning was really fun. Um, I'm a very type A like planner. Yeah, your checklists. Oh yeah. Like checklists for everything. And so, and we had so much, like we had so many family and friends helping us and like a friend did all of our florals, like at cost. Like there was just so many things that like God was just blessing us Yeah. in many ways during that season. So I think it really, there was not a lot of stress. It was just a lot of fun. Um, and then, yeah, we were... Let me see. We got, okay, so we got married in February of 2018. So in December, 
of 2017, I moved into our, like what would be our first place together. And then he moved in after we got married. Um, but yeah, that time was really fun for me too. Cause I was like getting to set up our first home together. And like, I had only lived outside of my parents' house for a year with some of my girlfriends. Um, so it was really fun, like getting to like make a home and yeah, that was, I don't know. That was just a really fun season and it went by so fast. And then yeah, February of 2018, we got married. What was, uh, what was early marriage like? Um, it feels like so long ago. <laughs> like, what was it's, it like? It's crazy how quickly it goes by. It really does. Yeah. I think early marriage for us. Well, okay. So like I said, he was not working. So he quit his job a month before our wedding and then we went on our honeymoon and then when we came back, we were like, okay, we got to figure something out. So that's when he started subbing. So I think kind of right away it was like, okay, we have stuff to like figure out with like what you're, what you want to do with your career and all the stuff. And then, um, I think our first year of marriage, we kind of, we went through a lot. Like his grandma passed away in July that year that we got married, which she was really old and like we knew that was coming and she was at peace and it was good. Um, but then in December of 2018, his mom super unexpectedly passed away. Mm -hmm. So that was like, and what happened? She, we were actually supposed to be going to get dinner with her and Skylar's dad. Mm -hmm. And, um, we were at home like waiting for them to come pick us up and Skylar's dad calls. So we're thinking, you know, he's out front. So we, Skylar answers the call and he's like, I need you to come to the hospital um, something happened to mom. Just get here as soon as you can. And we're like, what the heck? So we rushed to the hospital. And by the time she got there, or by the time we got there, she was gone. Um, she had like a small tear in her heart. Um, it was just super sad. She was just getting ready for dinner. And then just, I don't know, it just took her down. Wow. And there was nothing that anybody could have done to change anything. So... Yeah, that was really hard. Um, so I think the first year of our marriage, we kind of like, we kind of went through a lot. Yeah. And it, it definitely like brought us a lot closer together. And um, I think to God too, like we are, I think our relationships with God really strengthened during that time. Um, but yeah, it was crazy. It was a lot in the first year of marriage. Yeah. I think learning how to grieve together is a really difficult thing. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that doesn't, it doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. And then when it does happen, you realize people grieve differently. So it's difficult to do it together. Yeah, totally. That was interesting too, because I, I didn't know his mom that well. Like, you know, we, everything was so fast from when I met him. Like I had barely known his mom for like two, it had barely been two years. And so, um, but I'm a much more like emotional person than he is. And so for me, I feel like, yeah, we did like grief was handled in such different ways. Um, he was obviously devastated for like those first couple weeks. And then I think he kind of went through a time where he's like, didn't really want to talk about it. Um, it was just kind of easier for him not to like tap into that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was like an interesting thing for us to kind of navigate of like how, do we like in a healthy way handle grief together? So, yeah. No, I think we can make a jump. Uh, do you do you feel like in some ways God's hand was in that, just kind of preparing for how you grieve together? Uh, definitely, yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, yeah, because we've been through a lot of loss in the last three years, and so yeah, I do think that God was kind of like. Scott and I have talked about this too. We're like, we know like God doesn't do things, but he can use things. Yeah. And so I think that was a situation where definitely like he used, he used that to help us learn how to grieve together, um, learn how to like communicate during grief um, and, and like open up to other people about things too. Cause I think also during that time we, we both kind of like went inward a little bit mm -hmm. like to from other people you know it was just kind of easier mm -hmm. and when people would you know check in like how are you how are you guys we're good like we're okay and like that was kind of it like we didn't really let people like fully in and so 
I think God definitely, um, we've grown a lot in that way since then. Yeah. So, I mean, we could go there if you're open to it, but, but just, um, so you're talking about a lot of loss in the last three years and I know a bit of your story, but I, I'm, I'm interested to learn more as well. So, so talk to us about what you mean when you say that. Yeah, so we so 2019 was like our our first normal year of marriage. Okay. So after um you know his job stuff and his grandma and his mom 2019 was like we were chilling. Like we we got to really just enjoy marriage and enjoy our life together. And then on New Year's Day of 2020, I we found out that I was pregnant. And then like I think it was a week or two weeks later um, I was home, Skylar was at work and I just like started getting really bad, like pain in my stomach. Mm. And obviously I'd never been pregnant before. So I was like, I don't know, maybe this is like normal. Things are moving, changing, whatever. And then kind of progressively, like throughout the day, things were just getting worse and worse. And then, um, Skylar came home from work. And by the time he got home, I could like literally not move off the couch and so he was like, well, let's go to emergency room, try to figure out what's going on. I'm like, I can't get off the couch. Like, I literally can't move. So we had to call the um, ambulance. They had to, like, lift me yeah. up and put me on a bed. We get to the ER, and they, like, did an ultrasound. And she, the nurse was like, you're having a, a ruptured ectopic. So basically the embryo was growing in my fallopian tube and Mm -hmm. it had grown to the point where there was no room for it anymore and so my tube burst so I had like I think 11 ounces of blood just in my stomach oh my god so they're like we have to get you into emergency surgery and it was just like chaos and crazy and like could not even wrap my mind around what was going on and it was crazy too because my parents had a lot of fertility issues so my my biological sister and I were um, IVF babies. Okay. And so IVF was like very new. Yeah, I was going to say. That time. Yeah. yeah. And so um, my mom, before they did IVF, my mom <clears throat> had, I think, three or four ectopics, two of which were ruptured. So mm. at that point, they were like, well, we have to do IVF now. It's mm. kind of our, our only option. <coughs> um, so, so yeah, she that was like really heartbreaking for her my parents I think did they talk about that to you as you were growing up did yeah. you, you were aware of it yeah yeah we knew um we understood they like explained it to us and they're like yeah you guys were made in a petri dish at the same time actually and then Isabel was frozen for three years so it was always really cool to us we're like wow that's so crazy so yeah that we we knew about that you know our our whole life okay but um so yeah I think that was it was hard for my parents um and my grandparents, just because they're like, oh, this is like happening all over again. And yeah, it was just, it was weird. I feel like I, it didn't even really feel real to me until like after surgery, mm. um, I woke up in the room and I'm like, that really just happened. Like, it was just so, it was such a whirlwind. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of our like oh, still ongoing fertility journey so since then so in 2020 that happened and then we like took the whole year off from trying we're like we are not emotionally or physically like ready for any of this um we were like we're still young we've got plenty of time I was 23 yeah 23 24 when that happened and so um then in 2021 we started trying again and then since 2021 up until now I've had five miscarriages so it's just been this like long road of like unexplained like every doctor we go to it's like everything is normal everything looks good so we're like okay but it's not because this keeps happening yeah so I think it's interesting too because this for me like this is the first time in my life that I've really had to like my faith has really been tested and I've like really had to rely on God because I don't know, like my whole childhood and even in high school, like in the midst of kind of that conviction time, my whole life has been very like, 
I don't want to use the word easy, but like there wasn't a lot of stuff where I really had to rely on God. Yeah. So I think this has been, well, this has been the first time in my life where I really had to do that. And so, um, yeah, it's been like a whole new thing to navigate for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I got to imagine, cause you said multiple times when we first started this, that kind of your hope for the future was that you wanted to be a wife and you wanted mm -hmm. to be a mom. Yeah. So I, I got to imagine it's not just, just the grief of feeling like you've lost a child, but also the grief of like, there's some yeah. form of that, that dream or that hope that's, um, not, not happening. For mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, I think during one of the miscarriages, I think it was last springtime. I was like, I went through a period of time where I'm like, is God even real? Like, mm. how is this happening? Like he put this desire on my heart to be a mom. Like why? I don't understand. And so I think that was like actually the hardest period of time though, because then I kind of had gotten to a place where I'm like, I know God is in this with us. Like, you know that song, There's Another in the Fire? Yeah. Like, I have this image of God. Like, you know, every time we find out that we've lost a pregnancy of God, like, sitting in that pain with us. Like, he doesn't want this for us, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know, the reality of the broken world that we live in. Like, this was not the way that God designed our world to be. And so, you know, pain and loss and bad things just they exist and they yeah. just happen and um, God doesn't want it for us and he's in it with us. And so I think there's a lot of comfort for me in that. Um, but yeah, it still sucks and it's yeah. still not fun for sure. Yeah. As you're saying that, I, I feel like in my own life, there's, there's a big, huge difference from saying that, um, that this is not what God intended. This is the broken world we live in when you're talking about it, about someone else. Right. Yeah. But when it's you, everything going on in your head does not always happen in your heart. Yeah. Um, and you could know that that could be true kind of like intellectually, but experiencing it, I, I think, um, I think a lot of just the strength of you being able to tell the story I can just hear is that, you know, God is there, mm -hmm. which, so I'm just curious, um, how do you keep that in perspective? Because I feel like, um, we could very easily be talking about this story and it could be, that's where I lost my faith and decided God wasn't real. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what is it a, uh, about your story? Is it the people around you reminding you? Is it just how you were brought up? What is it that you feel like is keeping God close when you're, you just said you're questioning, like, is God real? And clearly you've yeah. landed at yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. How, did, how did you stay grounded in that? Um, I definitely think it's a combination of just the way I was growing up just, or the way I was raised. Um, just know, like, God just always existing in my life. I feel like God, um, I don't know. I feel like he's always just been very real, like, in my heart. And I feel like that's something that I can just never, like, get rid of. Like, even in the time of, like, is God real? It's like, I, I still knew in my heart that he was. I think I was just angry and um, uh, just kind of, like, took it out on God, kind of. But I think the people in my life and then definitely Skylar for sure. Like Skylar has stayed so like hopeful throughout this whole season. Um, and he, I don't know, I think, yeah, just the people in my life that we have praying for us and just some things that people have said to me too. Like, I think actually this might've been in a book or a podcast, but there's this girl, I think it was in her book she kind of has a similar story to me with her whole fertility journey. And um, one of the things that she said was like, we, we don't know how we're going to have kids, right? When we're going through fertility stuff, like maybe it's through foster care or adoption or, or biological, like you don't know how it will happen, but it will happen. Like if you keep pursuing it and if you keep like striving for that, it will happen at some point. And she said, um, God already has the birth dates of your babies written down and there's nothing that you can do to speed it up. And there's nothing that you, you can do to stop that from happening. And I was like, there's such a comfort in that. And just knowing that like God has my life mm. like in control and, um, how, whatever, however this pans out, like whatever ends up happening, I know is going to be so much better than anything that I could have planned. 
And, um, and I think that God is also, I think another thing to answer your question that has kind of helped me come back to this place of like knowing that God is real and like truly believing that. Um, I think he's used me in a lot of ways to, I've been very open about our story, like on social media, just with people. I've just been very, very open about it. And there have been so many girls that have come to me saying like, I've been experiencing something so similar or or struggling with this for years and like just haven't told anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that God is kind of using like our, our pain and like this really crappy time that we're going through and then kind of using it hand in hand with my like care for people and my like way that I like to communicate and have relationships with people. I think he's using those together um, because I think a lot of relationships have been built um, just through all of this. So yeah. Yeah, that's an incredible way that God connects. So, I, um, just an observation, and I wanted to hear your feedback. I think, um, so I think it was 2017. Um, we experienced a, a miscarriage, kind of late in the game, and it was kind of an awkward situation. I'm sure you've experienced more awkwardness than we have, but our experience was it had already been announced, and mm-hmm. people had already begun to know that we were having a little girl, and. Um, praying and excited. You know, we did like a gender reveal. It was like mm. at 14, 15 weeks. Yeah. Um, and then the awkwardness and coming to this conclusion that the I only want to say it once. I don't want to have this conversation a hundred times. So literally like stood up here and just told people this is what happened. Yeah. Um, this is not like an open invitation mm. that I want to process with you, but I also don't want to I don't want to hear like, congratulations, how's your wife feeling yeah. for the next two months because you weren't here one time, you know? Yeah. Um, but one of the things that happened from that, even though that was really terrible in so many ways, was so many people came to us, like, not literally, but like in the dark alleys, like, me too. <laughs> but I, I always wondered, um, why is it, why is it such a stigmatized thing? Is it, um, because so many people we found out are like, what? You were so close to us and you never, you never even mentioned it. Like, we're yeah. good friends mm-hmm. and you never mentioned that to us. Why do, you, why do you think that is? I think um, one thing that I have learned from this, and I think a big answer to that question, is um, the enemy wants us to be in isolation and in darkness. And when we share these things with people, we're surrounded with prayer and, and love and community and um, vulnerability and honesty. Like, there's so much goodness and, and working through grief too. Like there's so much goodness that can come out of um, like sharing your experience. But when you don't, you're alone in it. And you're my, at least for me, like my brain was just racing like mm. at a million miles a minute of like, this is never going to happen for us. Like we're never going to be parents. Um, the God never wanted this for us anyways. Just all these things that I just knew were not true. And I at the beginning, like I didn't open up about it. So there was nobody like Mm. speaking truth against, against those things. And so I think that, um, I think that the answer to that is I think, uh, the enemy just really wants us to be alone in it. And he doesn't want us to, to share these things. And I think for me, like one thing that the enemy, I think was kind of like putting in my head was like, don't be a burden to people. Like, mm. don't just like, just keep this to yourself. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's kind of it. I think he just doesn't want us to, to open up and have that, like that community. And I think that might not be true for everybody. Like maybe some, and for certain people in certain stages of whatever kind of pain they're going through, they might not be ready mm-hmm. to share. And I think that's fine. Um, but I think, I don't know. I think it's important to at least have your spouse or or one a, per, a pastor or somebody who knows what you're going through, so that you can be you can be cared for in yeah. that way. It's so interesting what you said. As you said, um, you didn't want to be a burden to anyone. Mm-hmm. I, I was just having this conversation with someone who was saying, you know, we convince ourselves that we're being a burden, and you know, mm-hmm. what, if my issue was bigger, I would share it. Yeah. Like, um, I'm aware of somebody in my past who literally was like three, four months 
um, to the end of their life with a battle with cancer before they decided to tell mm. people at a church. And it was like, and their same explanation was, oh, I didn't want to be a burden. And it's so uh, interesting that that's literally the exact opposite of yeah. what Christians are called to be, like to carry each other's burdens. But there is something that the enemy or the culture or whatever, maybe a combination of all yeah. of the above, that I don't, I don't want to be uh, a burden. I don't want to, you know, waste people's time or mm -hmm. make them think of me. Um, yeah, it's an it's an interesting battle people face. So we're already here. I I have a, a question for you, and um, feel free to be as honest as you want. Okay. Um, because I've had this conversation a lot behind the scenes. I've never done it on the podcast quite this way, although we've had a couple episodes with people who have talked about similar issues. But mm -hmm. it seems like everyone I talk to. Um, whether it's a wound that's healing or it's a wound that's still wide open, it's a wound. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people do things inadvertently. They say things that feel like my wound is is healing and God's healing it. But sometimes it feels like someone's taking a hot poker and just <laughs> jabbing you right in the center. Um, and I think um, it's hard in those moments to remember that people don't mean you harm, mm -hmm. um, but they are harming Um so I'm just curious, what what kind of uh, things would you tell someone? Maybe um, maybe they're someone who's hearing this and they're thinking like, oh, I know someone else. What would you say are, are some things where you're like, maybe you should think twice. Maybe you should just not say anything or, at all. What are the things that you're like, don't say that? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, if you if you don't know if somebody is going through fertility issues or, or issues... Well, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to specifically to like fertility stuff. Like don't, don't ask couples when they're going to be having kids. Like, I think that's my biggest thing. It's like, you don't know a lot of the time what people are going through. So I think that's a big thing. Just like, I think there are so many different ways that you can ask, like, how can I be praying for you? Or how can I, you know, be whatever in this season. But I think that's one specific thing. But, um, I think I don't know. I think in, in the season that Skylar and I are in of just like waiting, um, I think the biggest thing, honestly, like this is just a very simple thing is just genuinely asking how you can pray or how you can, um, just like be there for somebody going through mm. whatever it is. I think that's a very, just like kind of simple answer, but, um, I think there's a lot of comfort in knowing that like we're being prayed for. So for me, I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing. Mm. Yeah. I think it's one of those things Our our culture is like very quick and fast paced. So when we say things like, how are you mm -hmm. really? What we're expecting is you have five seconds to give me a quick answer so I can move along. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's us learning how to, say, how are you with the space for you to actually say, yeah. how are you? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm so guilty of that, you know? Oh, uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. And, um, and I think too, sometimes when you ask people that question, you're like, I don't want to pry or like, I don't know, maybe if they tell me they're good, they really are good. And I don't want to push for something more. But I think when you ask, when you ask it genuinely, like, and you give people the space or when you ask somebody how you can pray for them, then yeah, you are giving them that room to, to be honest, yeah. to open up. I was just having this conversation literally last night. Someone was saying, um, oh, I've been binge watching all the podcasts and I, I love, um, just the, the hours long conversations. Um, and they made the observation of like everything in the whole world is so fast. There's actually mm -hmm. something really refreshing about like an hour plus long. Yeah. Um, and they were um, talking about this. And, and I just made the point like you could build margin in your life to do it yourself. It doesn't have to be on a camera that's recorded. Mm -hmm. you know? That's so true. Um, and so often we could gravitate towards like YouTube where maybe somebody's literally going to be watching you and I talk. Mm -hmm. All the while, I'll be like, man, that's so cool. I wish I could have that. But then the answer is, you could have that. Mm -hmm, totally. You just have to make space and time, and you have to be willing to say, like, how are you? And we're seated, and we have five hours. You could tell me how you are. Yeah. Um, and that's so hard in our world to to do that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I feel like lately, too, so many people, and myself too, but like so many people I've been talking to are just in this season of busyness, like. Yeah 
And I know going into the holidays, like that's only going to get crazier, but yeah, it just feels like there's been so many people, um, like I said, Skylar and I included who life has just been like, it's just been busy and like nonstop. And when you get a moment to like, or when you have a night or a day where there's nothing going on, you just like, don't want to do anything. And so I think, um, yeah, busyness is definitely a big thing in our culture and also just seemingly in this season. And so, yeah, I think it definitely, um, requires a lot of intention to be able to like spend time with people and to really know what's going on in their life. Um, but it's very, it's really valuable when you get to do that and when you get to have like vulnerability with somebody and like walk together in prayer and yeah. check in over time and how they're doing. I think it's really, it's just really special. I think it's one of the gifts in a church community of people whose personality is, is kind of yours as the connector, because mm-hmm. I, I think I've realized there are a lot of people who are really scared to initiate, like they yeah. want that really badly. Um, but when you say like, Hey, let's grab lunch. It's almost like, Oh, I would love that. Yeah. And you realize like there's some hang up where they would be scared or intimidated to ask you. Mm-hmm. And you realize, oh, maybe that's just how they're wired. And maybe it's how certain people are wired to be the connection pieces yeah. and invite people into that. Yeah. Um, so I have uh, one more question, unless you wanted to keep chatting about that topic. But I, um, I'm always uh, aware because from the beginning of when we started um, the podcast, um, I realize there's a lot of young people who will watch. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just curious, what, w- what would you say to say a, a 16 or 17 year old, just maybe like a, a mini you mm-hmm. with dreams of being wife and mom. Um, and I think people carry around that, wow, that's a really difficult story that Roxy's telling, but that won't be me. Yeah. But in reality, um, it very well could be. So what would you, what would you tell a young, a young woman with kind of those dreams and aspirations? Man, I would say as early as you can, like really build a strong relationship with Jesus and um, really learn what it looks like to, to rely on him. Um, I think if you can practice that with small things in your life, that, that builds a lot of like faith and um, resilience that I think as that grows over time will really benefit you when you go through a season that's a lot harder. Um, I think, because like for me, I really, you know, like I said, this is the first time that I've really had to rely on Jesus and um, kind of like surrender everything to him. And so it's hard to do that. It's hard to like be building that when you're in a really difficult season. And so I would say like, whatever, whatever, uh, what's the word? Like issue that you're facing, whether it seems really small or not, just to learn, um, how you can rely on God for that. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think that, like I said, that will just build over time. And then when you have that foundation, when you're going through something really difficult, um, you've, you've like built that practice, yeah. you know how to rely on God. Yeah. I love that. We were just talking last night about kind of spiritual discipline in our relationship with God. The, the temptation is to make God like the prescription to the mm-hmm. problem. Like here's my problem quick, get God. Mm-hmm. But in reality, God has invited us to pursue him every single day. Mm-hmm. And then so often we have an issue of some kind arise and we realize God's already there with us. We don't mm-hmm. have to go summon him like, like the genie in Aladdin. Yeah. And quick, I only get three wishes, so what yeah. do I do now? Yeah. Like God has proven himself faithful in the easy, simple day-to-day stuff, and so I can trust him now. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had um, said you were listening to a podcast or some kind of show about um, you never know how this is going to happen for you. I know that there's some things in the works. Um, what are you pursuing on kind of being a mom? Yeah, so we are actually – okay, so we've seen an array of doctors. So we've gone to – just like regular OBs, fertility doctor, um, uh, naturopaths, acupuncture, like we've done so many different things. And like I've said, everything is pointed back to like normal. And so we right now are on a wait list for a doctor. The field is called reproductive immunology. Okay. And it's a very small field. There's five doctors in the country who do this. Wow. Yeah. Is there one, there's one here in Southern California? There's one in Cal, in Northern California, okay. but, 
Um, I've done a lot of research on all five of them, and I just don't feel comfortable with this doctor. <laughs> so okay. the one we're going to is in Michigan. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, Michigan so it is. Michigan, Detroit. So um, we are on a wait list for this doctor. They basically, they specialize in women who have had reoccurring miscarriages, um, failed IVF cycles, which we've not done IVF, but um, that or just unexplained infertility. Mm. So basically, it's really fascinating. They like they look at the the um, immunity health of your reproductive system. So there could be something as simple as like a blood clotting issue that's happening or for a lot of women who experience this, they've found through these doctors that our body is actually like when an embryo forms in our body, our body looks at it as a foreign object because it is, it's half of somebody else's DNA and yeah. they're like, what is this? So rather than it doing what it's supposed to and like growing, our body actually like fights it off as if it's like a cancer or something. Yeah. Very interesting. So um, we are on a wait list for this doctor. They, it's like a six month wait list. So we're hoping like February, I think February is like the six month okay. mark. So that's what we're doing. Skylar and I joke that like, we've gotten really good at waiting because that's kind of all we've done. We've prayed a lot over the years too of like, is like IVF or something like that, the route that we should be going. But we both just feel like God is saying no, like mm. at least not right now. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not against it. Like, I'm an IVF baby. I'm, if at any point we feel like God is, is directing us towards that, like, we will do it. Yeah. But right now, we just feel good about being on this wait list and just doing more waiting like we've been for yeah. the last few years. Um, waiting is hard, but we feel like this is where God has us. And so we're just trying to find peace in the waiting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. I think even that you're smiling and laughing is just testament to God in your life. Because I feel like um, these are the sorts of things that um, either reveal people's um, kind of ongoing spiritual weakness or their strength. Mm -hmm. I just see in you so much strength and willing to talk openly about it. So you had said uh, one, one thing that you would encourage people to do is just to ask honestly, like, how can you pray? Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're on a wait list. There's appointments maybe in the future. Uh, if people are watching this and they're like, I, I want to pray for Roxy and oh. Skylar, how, how would you ask them to pray? Um, I would I would ask for just continued like peace in the waiting. I think um, that's something that the I think that's something that the enemy can kind of like whisper into my ears, like you should be doing something mm. like why are you waiting? But I know like in my heart that that's not coming from God. Like the temptation to speed up God's time yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah. To like do something, but I don't, I don't know. There's nothing for me to do right now. And so I'm like, what does that even mean? So I think just, just peace in, in the waiting. Um, and ho- I mean, hopefully just for answers when we do meet with this doctor, um, Skylar and I have said like, even at this point, like, even if the answer is like, you won't be able to have kids or which we know God can still do anything, but like just some sort of answer would Mm. provide a lot of like, I think peace for us and just also some sort of other direction of how we can move forward. Mm. So, um, yeah. So I would say peace in the waiting and then hopefully some answers through this doctor. Yeah. Genuinely, thank thank you for being willing to talk about that. I I think it's a a topic, as you said, that people are all over the map and not a lot of open dialogue. So I'd imagine a lot of people will gravitate to, hey, there's someone who has the strength to to talk um, and find a lot of hope in that. So Mm -hmm. I I really do hope that once this airs, maybe maybe people we know well that we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, that um, your connection personality is like, hey, can I can I talk to you? I hope that that yeah, is an outcome. Me too. Um, but you have much more going on in life. Yeah. Um, so you're you're working for your parents' company, mm-hmm. um, and then some folks, especially if they came to a church barbecue, have experienced some fruit of uh, your labor. Yep. Um, describe to people what you've created, what you're continuing to create, and what's um, going on, because. Yeah. Um, you said that you finished high school, you kind of dallied a little bit in community college, but you just knew at the core, I'm, I'm a worker mm-hmm. um, and you've created something cool. So I'll just yeah. um, let you talk about it. Yeah, it's so fun. So it's called Off the Cart. Um, my friend and I do it together. So 
my my business partner Eric. He is a friend of mine in Skylar's um, that we met several years back, and we actually recently set him up with my sister Isabel. Um, so we so they're they're together. They're dating. They're in love. It's great. But um, so he's my business partner. So he actually had this idea to he went to uh, one of his friends daughter's birthday parties and he actually built for them like a little kind of like our cart but for like an acai thing so all the little girls just like made their own acai bowls and it was cute and then he was like this is actually a really cool idea and I feel like this could be some sort of like a business and so he was talking to me about it and asked me if I would want to try to figure to figure it out and do it with him yeah he actually asked Skylar and Isabel too and they're both busy with school and work and stuff. So they're like, no, <laughs> good. But I was like, I'll do it with you. So, um, yeah, so we started off the cart in August. And um, it's basically just the ice cream rental cart. So we, like, stock up the ice cream freezer with toppings and ice cream and all the things and then drop it off at parties. And people do, like, self-serve stuff. And it's been so good. Um, we have been very busy which has been good. Uh, you had mentioned this to me the other day. Like, tell people how busy, <laughs> how surprised you were, how busy. It's been like, so we started in August, right? So we knew August and September, we would probably have a handful of bookings, but then figured. Oh, because it's like hot summer. Right, months. summertime. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. It's ice cream, you know. And I know we're in California, but whatever. So then we figured we'll have some time during like the fall and winter to kind of really figure out like our business plan and you know, the small little things and then spring, maybe it'll pick back up. So is the plan like, let's just jump in and experiment and then we'll regroup and relaunch again or something. Yeah. And like, we never plan to like say no or to like close our doors for the winter or fall. We just assumed that like fall and winter would be a lot Based more on what chill. I've heard, you've assumed wrong. Have assumed very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like literally almost every single weekend since August. We've had um, at least one booking. So a lot of the weekends it's been two. So we've been uh, very busy. <laughs> it's been and, good. And how far out are people reserving it now? Um, we have somebody who booked us for a wedding next summer. But that's the farthest. Okay. So besides that, people are booking us like two or three weeks out. Um, December is pretty mellow, I will say. So I am looking forward to like, because it's, I mean, Eric and I, we both work during the week and then a lot of these events are over the weekends. So it's been a lot. It's been very like busy, but it's so much fun. It's a lot of fun getting to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's a piece of me that's like, um, if this explodes and, and you're the queen of ice cream one day, <laughs> like I interviewed her first when she only had one car. <laughs> yeah. So what's kind of the vision going forward? So we are, well, Eric, so Eric does, um, uh, like construction and home improvement stuff. So he builds things. So he built our cart. Um, so in December, he's going to start building our second cart. So we'll have that ready in January or February. <clears throat> so, um, we'll have two carts, which will be nice. Cause we have to, sometimes like people will, will request us for the same day. And so we have to say no, cause we only have one cart. So, um, building a second cart, uh, maybe hiring a person or two, which will be nice. So maybe my, oh, I didn't touch on this, but I have two younger siblings who are adopted. So Lena and Pasha, um, she's 19, he's 16 or 15. But um, to that point, maybe hire Pasha to like work for us and scoop some ice cream. The other day we had an event and Eric and I were scooping ice cream and just standing there in silence, like scooping. And he was like, if I never have to scoop another cup of ice cream again, I'll be okay. <laughs> I was like, I, we've... Put it in the business plan. Oh my gosh, yeah. We've scooped so many cups of ice cream. So we are like, we need to hire Pasha and he can make some money and <laughs> do that. So. Could you foresee this becoming like something that's like 20 carts or something? Hopefully, yeah. I mean, we have like different ideas for different kinds of carts that we want to do too. So we want to expand from just ice cream to like, I don't know. We have so many different ideas. Hey, don't share them. This things. is going on yeah, the World Wide yet. Web. You don't want competition <laughs> <laughs> jumping in. It's so fun. It's actually so cool because there have been so many people on um, our Instagram that we've like connected with who do similar things. Like they have mobile carts and whatever. And people are so nice and just like open about the things. Interesting. Yeah, which I didn't think that that would be a thing, but I've 
just kind of like there's been something that I've seen that someone does that's really cool. And so I'll message them and ask and I'm like, we'll see if they re- reply. And people do. They're like so honest and helpful. I would assume like in a, a small niche little business, yeah. like, somehow people would be like combative or like yeah. I'm not sharing with you how totally. I operate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People have been really awesome and just open and helpful so do you feel like it stretches like a part of your personality or your brain in a way that just wasn't being exercised before yes definitely there's um I've actually Krista has been a huge help with like so many things with permits and because there's so much that goes into it especially like being in the state of California so this is a whole new like food it's a whole new thing for me I've I've always been involved in Mm. like t-shirts with my family (laughs) food is so different yeah and so Krista has been like so helpful in helping me and answering questions so yeah yeah, she's so great and she's gonna be embarrassed that you said it out loud (laughs) there are so many people that know Krista that have the exact same story Um, I'm no longer taken off guard but um, just her willingness to jump in and help Mm -hmm. people in so many ways with no credit Mm -hmm. is like um, it's a it's a secret that's not kept. Everybody knows now. Yeah. No, she's so great. Yeah. She's been awesome. So yeah, it's definitely, there's been so many ways that I've like, um, or so many things that I've learned and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're covering a lot of ground here. I want to, um, go back really quickly and then we can kind of head for the finish line. But, um, you're relatively new here to Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like you've uh, fallen right into a wonderful spot. You know Krista, so you're in good hands. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, just talk about your journey as um, a married couple finding a church together. And then um, I saw that you guys became members. So you're like, you're, oh, yeah. you're at least uh, sworn members for a year, I they're think. They're locked in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so talk about uh, how you landed here. Yeah, so we um, when we were first married... And Skyler had left his church in Costa Mesa. Um, we kind of... Can I interrupt you really quick? Yeah. I, I really, really love how you're talking about churches and not saying names. I think <laughs> so often people have experiences and they kind of want to take an underhanded name yeah. that church and say something semi-negative. Yes. I really appreciate that about you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because after he left that church, it was kind of... He was burnt out. He mm-hmm. was very burnt out. And so we... Um, kind of like took a break from going to church and that was like that was nothing at all related to our faith like nothing changed um with our faith during that time but he was just really burnt out and so we kind of just weren't really going anywhere and then um we started going to a different church in Costa Mesa um because we were living down there so I think this was probably after our first year of being married he was like okay I'm ready to like maybe get involved in a church again so we were there for a while, um, for probably like three years or two or th- two or three years, and then COVID happened, um, and so it just made it really hard for us to get like, I mean, we had started going, then COVID happened shortly after, so it was really hard for us to get plugged in, and then um, when they started like regathering, it was almost like the people of the church were so excited to see each other again because it had been so mm-hmm. long. Yeah. So we kind of felt like outsiders a little bit which was fine we're like we'll you know give it some time get involved a little bit more so we did like we kind of stayed committed to it but it just didn't it was not our it was not our home church we just kind of knew it after a while Mm. um and then we moved to orange in 2021 i think yeah 2021 like still kind of covid Yeah, still kind of, yeah. And so we were still going to that church in Costa Mesa. Um, but then we were like, hey, we need to find something closer to us. Because not that Costa Mesa is that far, but we're driving all this way for a place that doesn't really feel like our home yeah. church. And so we had every intention of like finding a place, but then time just kind of went by and what were the things you were uh, kind of looking for? Was it stuff that you could like quantify or was it more like when we walk in, we'll know? Well, so we didn't, we honestly didn't talk about it. It was kind of this like, let's find something. And we're like, okay, but then didn't really do anything. And then some of our, some of our best friends, they live in Idaho. They were down here visiting. Um, okay, so we started coming here. It was early this year. So I think it was like January, February, 
our friends were visiting us and they were asking about church. They're like, where are you guys going? We're like, we're not. And they're like, okay, like you guys need to go somewhere. Like, Good friends. They're the best. We are so grateful for them. Yeah, they're, they're the best. We wish that they lived here so bad. But um, so they like sat down with us and they were like, let's talk about what's important to you guys. Like what, what is it that you feel like you're looking for in a church? So we like actually made a list together and we were like, we wanted something smaller because like we wanted to be part of a community. Um, so that was a big thing for us. We were like, we don't want something super like, like flashy or crazy. Like we just want it to be mm. based on like relationships and like reading scripture from the Bible and like teaching from that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like those are the things that were kind of important to us. Something close. We wanted something really close to us. Um, so those were kind of, those were like the main three or four things. It was nothing crazy. Um, so then we went on Yelp and looked at churches in the area and then just kind of made, we made a list of like five or six churches. And I think this was, this was the first church that we came to Okay. and we sat back there and, um, we, after service, like five or six people, you got you and Joel and, um, trying to remember who else. Abby's brother, who I guess doesn't normally come here, but he was here oh, that cool. week. I yeah. Remember that, yeah. Yeah. So Lisa, like so many people came up and they're like, Hey, we've never seen you guys before. And we're like, Oh my gosh, this is like instantly something that we like really wanted. Like mm. this is like the community. I'm glad because some personalities are like, I want to fly <laughs> under the radar and now everyone's swarming me and I can't get out. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, we wanted, we wanted to be like known and we want to yeah. like know the people that we're sitting next to. And, um, so yeah, we were like, we were instantly like, I think this, uh, this could be the church, but we were like, maybe we should just still test out a couple other church, like church shopping, you know? And so we went to a couple other churches in the area and every time we were just like, I wish we were at bridge right now. Like, oh. yeah, this just like really felt like a church home to us, like so instantly. And so, um, yeah, we were like pretty committed to this place right off the bat. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I have only glowing things to say, of course. <laughs> um, no, I, I think one of the things that um, I love about our church is I feel like it's messy people who are allowed to be messy, mm -hmm. but it's messy people reminding each other that, that Jesus is cleaning up our mess. And totally. it's really kind of in the fellowship aspect. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. um, I love that there's not a lot of fluff. Um, yeah. There's not a lot of entertainment kind of based stuff. It's, mm -hmm. I was just sharing last night during midweek, I, I'm noticing this trend and especially young people who just don't want that anymore. Mm -hmm. they, like you said, like, let's just go somewhere that's going to do Bible and yeah. worship and real legitimate community. Um, I think COVID maybe shook some of that out of people of, um, let's go back to the basics of what really matters. Yeah. I feel like it's so refreshing and cool to be a part of. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and I think, like, similarly to what we were talking about earlier with, like, God does different things with different people and, like, a desire to be more relational or a desire to be more career-focused, all these different things. I think he can do that same thing in churches. Like, there are some people who maybe at least in the beginning of their walk with Jesus, like, the flashiness or the crazy worship, like that's what draws them in. And so, and then over time, like maybe they stay because they're actually building their relationship with God. Mm. And so I think that he can use those different churches in different ways, yeah, of but, course. but yeah, for sure. There's definitely this, this wave of like, that just doesn't matter. People yeah. just want to be, I think genuinely people just want connection. They want to be known. They want to learn um, about God and like what God has done in the world and what he's doing for us. And so, yeah, I think it's so cool. Mm, it's awesome. Um, um, we could wrap up. I, um, at the end, I always try to share something and I was reading a while ago, actually, uh, probably almost a month ago now, uh, not long after you told me that you would, um, come on. And I was reading through, um, the book of Romans. And at the end, I just feel like, man, uh, I'll show you on the page, maybe when the camera can see. It's the scripture that just kind of sits right there, like really, um, really convenient and comfortable mm -hmm. on the page, where it's just like a nugget yeah. right there. Um, and I just felt like uh, I want to write this in, and I want to remind, remember. Um, but I just felt like God put this on my heart for you as we wrap up. It it says this: uh, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Mm, that's, that's so it. good. I just love the, the hope of God filling you with joy and peace and just continued growth in hope. Um, I just love it. It's a bite-sized thing. It's uh, sometimes um, in a really chaotic world, it's the simple, beautiful truths that just linger about us. So my, my prayer for you, Roxy, is that um, your hope would never cease. It would just continue to grow. And the evidence of that would be um, just the smile on your face and the joy and the peace about you. And I, I think as I was reading it, what I, what I love about it is um, I think if people have watched this far um, and they're just watching and listening to you, is hope and joy and peace are not, I hope I get there when I get through the storm. It's, um, it's a reality in the storm. In so many ways, as you've talked, um, you're still kind of walking in a mm -hmm. storm and it yeah. might be a while, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think uh, what I love about how you've talked about it um, just with so much strength is you're, you're not naive. You know mm -hmm. it is what it is. You kind of call it exactly what it is. And that is um, kind of how you rob it of its strength against you. Yeah, that's so true. And um, I think uh, this conversation is a, a phenomenal one. I really do just have a deep sense that um, there's going to be people who get a hold of this and feel like, wow, there's somebody willing to share a story that's very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe... Maybe God has enough strength that he could give me that I could do it too. So yep. I just wanted to say thank you. Thanks for thank saying you. yes. Um, and if there's anything you wanted to kind of sign off with, um, you're welcome to. Yeah, I think um, the only other thing I was thinking about this, um, this was from another book that I read, and I shared this on one of my like posts on social media. Um, but there was like a quote that I heard in this book, and she said to not let your... Uh, waiting season be a wasted season. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can apply, you know, not just to people struggling with fertility, but like whatever season of waiting that you are in, like don't let that time be wasted. Like mm -hmm. let God use you, um, still find joy in it. And so I think that is just a little like, I don't know, that was just something I kind of had in my mind that I wanted to share because yeah. that really, that did a lot for me and has done a lot for me. So. Yeah. You've made mention of social media a handful of times. Is this something that you kind of like put out on social media pretty often? Um, yeah, here and there I will. I'll share. I'm just very, I think, uh, I'm just kind of open with it because, again, it kind of allows people to, um, like, it gives them the freedom to, like, chat with me if they want to. So I just do it so that just to open the door for people. Very cool. Yeah. Well, if you're comfortable with it, maybe uh, on, on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, if you're comfortable, I'll, I'll put a yeah. link to your social media. Yeah. And it sounds like you're very comfortable if someone wanted to shoot you a, a private message and just yeah. say, here's what I'm going through. Yep. Um, Definitely. And I'll also do it for your uh, off the cart. So if you want yeah. some, some <laughs> ice cream and you want to book it, you better book six months in advance if you want any chance. Uh, well, we'll sign off here. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'll change your uh, contact in my phone to your real name and not Sweet Roxanne, heart, heart, heart. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah.